how this blue, though, is stronger in some cultures than in others. Uh, I call this uh, distinction uh, tight versus loose Norman structures. This actually comes from Pier Pietro Pelto in his 1968 paper, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Tight cultures have very strong cu cultural glue. They have strong norms and strong punishments for deviance that restrict the range of variation that is permissible in those groups. Loose cult groups, by contrast, have much weaker norms that afford a wide range of permissible behavior um, and are much more informal. Um, Herodotus actually is one of the first people to write about this, even though he didn't use the terms tight and loose. He contrasted the strict regulations of Egypt, for example, with the more loose uh, practices of Persia. Uh, the, Her the Histories is actually a phenomenal book on cross-cultural psychology. Many of you have read it. But it was really one, an anthropologist that many of you will be familiar with that first started to examine the strength of norms in traditional societies. Uh, Pietro Pelto studied 21 traditional societies and rank ordered them in terms of uh, how theocratic they were, how much, um, how much uh, home ownership was public and corporate, and many other variables. And he contrasted groups like the Hutterites, the Hanalu Vara, as being very strict in their norms and punishments and very formalized as compared to the Kongushmen um, and the Skolt Laps, where um, actually originally Pietro, uh, Pelto was doing his research on reindeer. Um, and argue that they were much more permissive and had a wide range of uh, behavior that was afforded. I started to think about this contract as a PhD student in Champaign-Urbana, uh, working under Triandis, uh, because it kind of got left off the cultural map in cross-cultural psychology. Many of us started looking at the difference between individualism and collectivism, how much people emphasize independence and privacy versus uh, group belonging. And many other constructs, especially norms, really stopped, were very understudied in the field of cross-cultural psychology. And so I started thinking about how do we understand the strength of norms, why do they evolve differently around the world, and with what trade-offs for human groups. And does this pattern um, look similar across nations, across states? We zoom in further, does it represent different social classes? How do we understand what the brain, how the brain is functioning with, with respect to social norms? That's the kind of territory I'm going to talk about today, in addition to culture change. How can we predict when tight and loose will change, uh, both in terms of individuals, but also large-scale cultural groups. And finally, I'll end on talking about how do we harness the power of social norms to, for a better planet. How do we understand when we need to tighten up and when we need to loosen up. So let me just kind of start with the national level. I was told that you know, clarification questions are welcome, and then we'll just otherwise have a discussion at the end. So I started thinking about this at the national level and, and wanted to measure uh, tightness and looseness at the national level. And what I did was a study that was published uh, about five years ago uh, across six continents, about 7,000 people uh, around the world, who I was asking them questions about the strength of norms in their cultural context and other uh, situations that they were in, as well as personality attributes. And at the same time, I was collecting data on the macro, historical, and ecological context of these nations. Um, and I was also sending people after that to do kind of weird things in these countries, break norms, uh, wear stigmatized types of identities. I bought you know, 20 graduate students who went back to their home cities to wear warts or tattoos and ask for directions. Uh, I also was gathering a lot of other data from the World Value Survey and other sources to try to understand this construct and how it operates at the national level. After this, I'm going to zoom in. Uh, to the theory at other levels of analysis, because in any country we can see there's a most tight and loose element. So what I found was I was able to, I used measures such as asking direct reference shift questions to people about norms in the country, about punishments, um, whether they, when they break norms, how many people follow norms in the country, and I was able to see that people tend to agree on these constructs within nations. Even if they're from very different cities, they're able to um, to assess their country at the country level in terms of the strength of norms, countries like Singapore, Japan, Pakistan, but also Germany and Austria in our data were quite tight. Cultures in this 33 nation study that were very loose included New Zealand, Brazil, Greece, the Ukraine, and the United States was also moderately loose. You could see all the country rankings uh, in the study, but I was really more interested in what causes the evolution of tight loose at the national level and what trade-offs it provides for <coughs> groups. And this trade-off you're going to see remarkably similar across other levels of analysis. So what I found was that, with all this data, was that tight cultures had a lot of order. They had much less crime, they had more security personnel per capita, and they had more <coughs> cleaning personnel per capita. So what's one thing you can start to think about, I know Dan has written about monitoring and how that affects cooperation, 
Mon people who are monitored are, are abiding by norms more, and that includes being monitored by um, police, but also helps people to behave themselves when they see that they're in a clean environment. Um, also, they had much more uniformity type cultures. They, we measured things like uniformity of dress, uniformity of cars and parking lots. They have more synchronous clocks in city streets. For example, we connected our data on type loose rankings with Levine's data on um, clock synchronicity. In places like Brazil, when you look at clocks around the streets, they don't really say the same time. You're not quite sure what time it is. When you're in Switzerland and Germany and Austria, you, have, you know precisely what the time is. This is kind of a coordination mechanism, having synchronous clocks. Also, other people outside of my group have shown in the Journal of Financial Economics recently that stock prices are more synchronous. <laughs> Buying and selling of stocks are more synchronous in tight cultures. So there's just more synchrony and uniformity, and that's what tight cultures buy you. Also, they tend to be more self-regulated. There's more self-control in tight cultures. There's lower alcohol intake. There's lower gambling and debt. And there's also <coughs> less fat people <laughs> in tight cultures. Actually, even controlling for height and other characteristics you could see that there's much more self-control in tight cultures. So order and self-control and synchrony are really the, the primal um, advantage of tight cultures. But and at the flip side, you, could say, you can see the flip side is that loose cultures are much more disorganized, they're much less synchronous, and they have a lot of self-regulation problems. So that's one thing that we can take from some of this data. Loose cultures, by contrast, have greater openness. They really can... Um, they really have much more openness toward different people. They have less superiority about their countries, according to the World Value Survey, more accepting of immigrants. When we evaluated how long it took people who were wearing these stigmatized <coughs> identities, such as warts and tattoos in different countries around the world, it was people in loose cultures that were much more positive in reacting to those people. Tight cultures were much more uh, aloof in treating people with stigmatized identities in these field experiments that we did. We also can see that loose cultures have greater creativity. There's other data outside of our lab that was published in ASQ that shows that um, in large <coughs> field crowdsourcing experiments that people from loose cultures are much more likely to enter uh, these contests and they're much more likely to win. And finally, they're also more open to change, loose cultures. We can see this um, in terms of the amount of dissent that we've measured with the World Value Survey and also our own models, competition <coughs> models of how long norms, new norms, take to propagate into the population of loose cultures. So you can see here this really big trade-off between order and openness. Tight cultures are very orderly, but they're very um, closed minded in, in, is how we can see it. And they have um, far less openness and creativity and openness to change. So the question is, what predicts tight use? There's no effect of GDP. We have tight cultures that are rich, like Singapore and Japan. We have loose cultures that are struggling. Um, like Brazil um, and Greece. Uh, there's no common language, there's no common religion, though tight cultures are more re religious in our data, which is another way of my monitoring. Um, and there's no common geographical location. So what predicts tight loose? This is what we set out to do. And I, when I chose these nations, I had, a, I had a hunch, or at least I was betting NSF money on this hunch, that, that these differences evolve for a good reason. And they evolve because of threat. That in tight cultures, strong norms and punishments enable greater coordination for groups to deal with a variety of different threats that their nations or their groups, we'll see other levels of analysis, have chronically experienced. So human threats could be things like high population density, territorial threat, how many times you're being invaded by your neighbors. Natural threats include things like not having many natural resources or having a lot of natural disasters, Mother Nature's fury, uh, or having a lot of pathogens. So we can think about this, that if you're chronically experiencing a lot of threats, and these are not randomly assigned around the world, some nations experience for thousands of years way more of these than others, that the idea is that strong norms help these, these contexts to coordinate for survival. Uh, a good example is um, Singapore. It has about 18,000 people per square mile, compared to New Zealand that has about 30 people per square mile, and more sheep per capita apparently than people. Uh, it has had a lot of history of conflict in its nation. It's had a lot of, it has three countries <coughs> where there's a lot of diversity within a context where there's a lot of people. Um, Japan also has had a lot of natural disasters. We could see what happens, how coordinated people become effortlessly when those things happen. History of conflict is another good example. The U.S. Um, is lucky to have be separated by two oceans uh, and be, with some exceptions in terms of threats, be relatively safe nation. Uh, my 
So about five years ago, my daughter asked me if we're worried about Mexico or Canada invading us. And I thought, that's a really interesting kind of question, because we take it for granted that we don't have to worry about this. Of course, now we have much more potential threat, and I'll talk later, that also tightens us. But anyway, the data, I collected data, sometimes when I could get back to even 1,500 for population density, conflict, I measured how many times a nation's been threatened by its neighbors over a 100-year period, period by the crisis um, archives by um, Jonathan Wilkenfeld, natural disasters, we got data uh, from the World uh, Bank and other, and World <coughs> Health Organization, and, and likewise. And so what you can see is that even controlling for a lot of things, that population density, food deprivation, disasters, territorial threat, and pathogen prevalence all are correlated. This is all correlational, so we have to sort of um, see later some experimental evidence of this with uh, how tight a culture is. With respect to territorial threat, I also wanted to see, is it really just about being involved in conflict? Or is it about being, it being on your soil? And it turns out that being involved in international conflict, the United States has been involved in a lot of conflict, is not related at all to tightness. It really has to do with threat on your soil. Uh, in this study, I also want you to think, a look at what's the individual level correlate of tight loose. I don't like to talk about individuals as tight or loose, because that's a confounding levels of analysis. But I think about it as a tight loose mindset, or when people feel more accountable. So that's really how I think about tight loose at the individual level. And what we can see in a cross-level analysis with my data, with this science paper, is that people in tight cultures have more prevention focus. They're more cautious and more rule-oriented. These are all individual level variables that are affected by the strength of norms. They're more self-regulated. They have higher impulse control and self-monitoring ability. These are all scales that we, eval we validated across cultures. I'm skipping over a lot of details of like 10 years of my life. Factor analysis, Procrustes analyses, translations, etc. Uh, they also have higher um, needs for structure. <coughs> and by contrast, people in looser cultures have much more of a promotion focus. They're less self-regulated, and they have more toler tolerance for ambiguity. This actually is um, something that helps people to fit into the strength or weakness of social norms in their environment. I'll, I'll just ask you, what kind of situation is this? Is it tight or loose? Here? Yeah. This is really tight. I've always wanted to dance and like break out some vodka and like just do weird stuff in these kinds of talks because we are in a very tight situation. You have a very tight mindset right now. You have high felt accountability. That's why you're monitoring impulses, you're avoiding making mistakes, you're, you know, you're structured in this context. And so we all effortlessly navigate between tight and loose situations during our days. Tonight at the restaurant, I'm expecting we're going to rally and do some weird things. <laughs> uh, and we, all, we all are able to do this, but it just means that in some cultures where there's stronger situations more chronically, where life feels like you're maybe at a talk like this more often than it does feeling like you're in a public park or at a party, then you are more chronically, uh, have more of these attributes chronically accessible. It doesn't mean that you're not. Sometimes in a looser mindset, when you go home at night, uh, in a tight culture, uh, when you're out drinking with people, you can loosen up. Uh, there's some context here that we're tighter than looser. So this is just a framework to think about our behavior on a daily basis. Uh, I want to mention that I wanted to go back to Pelto's original work. Uh, and I work with Carol Ember to try to evaluate now more directly with ratings of uh, norm strength in traditional societies using the standard sample if we can test this theory. So Pelto sort of speculated, well, my, maybe this stuff is evolving because of population density and because of agriculture. But he never tested it, and I went out to sort of revisit some of his work. So this is some work that we, that we have funded through NSF. We coded tight loose in 85 societies from the standard cross-cultural sample. Uh, we had, this was a, I mean, as all of you know, this is a big pain in the neck. I mean, this, is, this took years to do because it's very laborious uh, work to get integrated reliability. Uh, we had developed a direct measure of tight loose across multiple items about how constrained people's behavior was in this group. Was it very constrained, moderately constrained, moderately unconstrained, or very unconstrained? We also had questions about punishment and conformity. We, and this was for overarching, like overall, after reading many domains in the ethnographies, but we also wanted to target different domains of life in these different countries, in these different societies. So we had people rating, separated by different domains, law and ethics, socialization, that included infant socialization, a young childhood, later childhood, and adolescence. Uh, we had them also coding for gender norms and how strict or permissive they were, marriage norms, sexuality, and funerals. Uh, and, um, then we were able to see these are actually very highly interrelated. 
uh, and we can give these um, traditional societies a score on their overall degree of tightness. You can see sort of this is main effects. <coughs> Funerals seem to have the most tightness across the board, but there's actually moderate levels, uh, and on average, tightness in these traditional societies. Um, and really what we wanted to see is can we test this idea that these are very <coughs> in part, not fully, of course, but due to threat. And we can see that when we look at population density, when we look at um, warfare, this is using some of Ross's variables and Carol Ember's work, when we look at pathogens, uh, when we look at scarcity to some extent, we can see that they're all correlated with tight loose in these, uh, the standard sample. We're now actually analyzing more of this data to try to use a multi-level approach, put these, cluster these groups within families of language and, other, uh, and so forth. And so I'll be back in touch about this kind of work. Peter Churchin and I are also now starting to think about how we might code tight loose in some of his work with CSTAT. So stay tuned for that. We want to say that, look, norms change over time, but the basic template of tight and loose uh, is, is pretty consistent. OK, I want to just zoom into the state level before I get into social class and some of the neuroscience stuff that we've been doing. Then I'll get into cultural change. Uh, here again, we wanted to look at, well, especially in a diverse culture like the United States, maybe we should be able to find state variation in the strength of norms. A lot of times we think about our variation in terms of superficial types of characteristics, like red state or blue state. And we wanted to say, well, maybe there's a, a broader theory that can help us understand our differences, and maybe the same pattern and trade-offs exist at the state level. Mm -hmm. I think you could probably guess where California came out <laughs> in our data. Uh, we, uh, in this particular case, this was published in PNAS a couple years ago with my student, Jesse Harrington. Uh, we basically gathered a lot of archival data to, um, at the state level in terms of strictness of punishments and latitude, so for example, in each state, how many, what percentage of kids are hit in schools that where corporal punishment is still allowed? Um, another example of latitude would be how many counties in the state are dry. Uh, that's a restriction. You go to Indiana, which I've given talks at Purdue, like you can't find any alcohol anywhere. You know, you come to California, I, I think we know, you know, there's a lot of latitude for lots of different things. Um, so we uh, created an index of tight loose with archival data. Uh, we then uh, validated it with other measurements from Gallup and other things about how people perceive the strength of norms in their state. Uh, and we were able to see here that, that the coasts are, are quite loose. Um, you could see New York and New England is quite loose compared, to, and as well as California. The South is quite tight. Uh, and then you have variation in the Midwest. Indiana, Ohio, um, and so forth are quite tight. We could see that Utah is tight, Dakotas, and so forth. But what we wanted to see again is that is there any pattern with, with, with respect to threat and the trade-offs that we show at the national level. So you can see here that food insecurity, storms and floods, <coughs> disasters, disease stress, pathogens again. Uh, and also in this case we wanted to see how rural our country are these states, because the greater degree of rurality, if we can call it that, means more monitoring. It means the gossip mill is active, it's keeping people behaving themselves um, and, um, and monitored. <coughs> and so we can see that there's a similar pattern. Population density did not predict in the states. I don't think we have enough extreme variation in, um, in, in population density here. <coughs> uh, we don't have a lot of data, of course, on internal conflict, so that was harder to test for the U.S. states. But we did try to test for whether the Civil War had any implication for the development of tightness. Uh, our argument was that, and this is actually Colin Woodard's argument in the 13 Nations, that the South felt like they were being invaded. Um, and especially the states that had a really big stake in slavery felt that they were extremely threatened. And so we actually went back and got some data that's published in this paper of the percentage of slave-owning families in a state, even in the South, because they varied a lot. Those states that had a lot of, um, of slave-owning families had much more to lose with this threat and those states are actually tighter today in our data. It's kind of an indirect way to try to look at threat in the US. Uh, we also gather data from a variety of sources to look at the tightness trade-off. And we can see that state tightness was correlated with uh, Renfro and Gosling's personality conscientiousness, the big five. They have a study of where the US states rank on different personality dimensions. This is related to self-control. It's about being dutiful, uh, being organized, um, being self and being having self-control. Other data that we collected showed that there was greater social organization in tight states that had more law enforcement, <coughs> less homelessness, less divorce, less mobility, leaving, coming and going from states. Uh, and they also had higher self-control, even controlling for poverty and other things. Um, they had lower drug abuse, 
uh, and they have less debt. Comparatively, loose states fall short of these things. They're way more disorganized, they have less um, stability, and they have less self-control. They have more self-regulation problems. But like we showed at the national level, we could see that state looseness is associated with openness in a wide variety of data sources. There's greater personality openness in the big five. There's greater creativity. This is uh, now patents per capita, fine artists per capita. Uh, there's more equality, less discrimination. This is, we studied this with EEOC claims and minority-owned businesses even controlling minority, minorities in a state. And again, on the flip side, tight states struggle with these things. They're far less open. They're much less creative. They're far more discriminatory. Um, we also, more recently, we're looking at things like how rude are states. I come from New York. You know, not surprising, it came up as number one rude state. Um, when I came from New York to Champaign-Urbana, I was, you know, flipping people off. I didn't think that that's that rude. If you do that in the South, you're going to be chased in a car and, and worry for your life. Um, and it turns out that when I correlated um, surveys of how rude states are with our, our data, it turns out it's true that loose states are by far more rude than tight states. But there was another index that was how fun are the states. This is how much entertainment options there are, how many public parks, and that's where looseness actually won. Loose states are much more fun uh, than tight states. And so you can see there's a direct trade-off, that you know, it's hard to be fun and also uh, polite. You have to choose which of these advantage points that you have. Uh, so there's a lot of other data I could talk about with the, tight, with the state level, but it just suggests that we can zoom into, particularly in the United States, I don't think you can see this in all countries, you're not going to see in Singapore like as much variation clearly. Might see some in China. We're starting to look at this. Again, it's uh, a huge country. There's a lot of variation. Um, it's very hard to study the same kind of patterns in China for a lot of obvious reasons, uh, in terms of data collection and um, and openness access and so forth. It's also thousands of years of data to look through. But we'll we'll try to see if we can see it, detect a similar pattern. Um, okay, I want to just talk about social class. Uh, because this is a really neglected aspect of culture. There are some emerging um, papers on class as culture. Uh, and we thought that this is really something that applies very much to understanding our growing divides between the working class and middle and upper class. This is kind of a shifting axis of difference, of divide that we see all over the world. And I think it came you know, into really huge focus during the elections, in the US election, during Brexit, in, uh, in France and so forth, we're seeing this kind of axis connecting or actually um, <coughs> showing disconnect between the working class and the middle class. And um, we were curious about whether tight moose applies to this, um, this distinction. The question is, do they differ in their levels of norm strength? And the idea would, was, was going into this is that you know, the working class is exposed to much greater threat. Uh, they have to worry about falling into uh, hard living or poverty, some sociologists would say. Uh, their occupations are far more dangerous, uh, and they have far less discretion. Um, this is something that um, Cohen talked about, sociologists. I met him recently in, in Washington, because his 1972 or so class and conformity book was, it was about class and conformity, but it, he didn't really kind of brought, brought it out to be thinking about it, what are the causes and consequences of this working class families. But he argued that parents are assessing what kind of job structures are their kids going to be having to occupy. And they, they recognize their kids are going to be in contexts that are more dangerous, where there's more injury, and where they're not going to have a lot of freedom, so they better be able to follow the rules. Middle class families, by contrast, are assuming their kids are going to occupations where they have more freedom, and more discretion, and more safety. So they can train them to kind of not take rules so seriously. Um, and we wanted to, and, and also there's less mobility in the working class. So we thought this was a really good sort of anecdotal evidence that maybe there are really differences in norm strength in these populations. So what we did was we went out, we surveyed uh, you know, over a thousand people to first get a sense of when we asked them the same questions that we asked in the science paper about the strength of norms in their childhood, in their schools, in their occupations, is there a difference between working class and, and upper class? We were uh, actually differentiating them based on education. There's a lot of debate about this, but it could be income. Education is a prime source of difference between the working class and the middle class, uh, in this case meaning having only a high school education or some college versus graduating college. And you could see a really big difference in our data um, between the working class, both in daily life, childhood, in the workplace, and also a higher desire for tightness, wanting strong norms. <coughs> These are all surveys, so we wanted to get some qualitative data. We asked people simply to tell us uh, 
uh, give us five words for rules and for breaking the rules. We just wanted to have them list and free association, what do they think about when they think about rules and breaking rules, and we can then code them with independent coders for how positive or negative they are. And it was very clear that the working class had much more positivity about rules and much more negativity about breaking rules and vice versa among the middle class. We also can see that they are in fact more threatened. We add zip code data, we asked people for the zip code data, went back to uh, other sources of the census to measure unemployment, crime, and so forth. They actually live in more threatening places. Um, and uh, they also had self-reported on our scales that they had more threat. So that was kind of initial evidence that we could see that there is a difference in tight moves among the working class and the middle class. We could see also that the same trade-off exists. This is in the same paper I'm describing that's um, about to go under review. Um, the working class reported have being more ethical um, and also seeing less uh, moral justifiability for various behaviors. Uh, there's other people around the country that have been showing this also. Uh, Piff, at, I believe is at, uh, I'm not sure where Piff is, maybe is at Berkeley, but he actually had people hiding in bushes and measuring what fancy cars do in the streets versus <coughs> working class cars and found that the fancy cars are more likely to almost run people over on, on city streets. Uh, and it was the working class cars that were more uh, behaving themselves. Uh, so this is something that is really part of the tightness construct, is being um, more norm abiding. But we can also give creativity tasks, as we did in this study. We had people doing various tasks where they're asked to come up with ideas for a paper clip or a brick, and we can code these for how, uh, how, many, ta how many things they come up with and how novel they are. And we can see in our data that the working class had far less creativity um, than the middle class. And they were also less open to a wide variety of stigmatized individuals. Uh, this includes immigrants on surveys in our data, homosexuals. It includes people with tattoos and so forth in our experiments with the IAT. So you could see the same general trade-off as well um, in the middle class. So one of the things that we wanted to do in this study is also see how early um, does this start developing among the working class and middle class. It's the first developmental study that we did. We were borrowing Tomasello's uh, paradigm uh, of Max the puppet, because it's hard to ask three-year-olds about norm violations, right? <laughs> so um, we can bring them in. Uh, these are 30 working class individuals and 30 uh, middle and upper class kids. It turns out to be very hard to recruit these samples. Even at Maryland, where there's a huge developmental science community, they don't study the working class. They study middle class kids. I'd imagine a lot of this research is based on middle class kids in, in Western psychology. And they played games with this puppet. You can see the puppet right there. This is a working class kid whose mother gave me permission to use this photo. There's Jesse Harrington, who's showing her the game. So what he's doing in this case, just like Tomasello did in his studies in Germany, they're teaching the child about playing a game, what the rules are for the game. It's called daxing. And the puppet's playing it correctly, but then all of a sudden the puppet <coughs> starts violating the rules. So it's doing all sorts of weird things and calling it daxing. <coughs> and then the simple question is, when we're videotaping these kids, what do they do? You know, what's their reaction? And so we had independent coders coding how they reacted, and it was really clear that the working class were more bent out of shape uh, with the rule violations. They were more likely to correct the puppet, they were more likely to express irritation with <coughs> the puppet. The middle class uh, was more likely to be laughing. I mean, and, and being, you know, this is funny. Like, look at the Max's crazy puppets doing. So this is a really interesting paradigm to think about. How early does this develop? Um, it's a really interesting point, I think, because especially during this divide of working class and middle class, we often don't realize like how ingrained these things get from an early age, um, and then suddenly thinking we could just kind of change people's cultures in this new world of globalization is really uh, kind of silly in a lot of ways, um, given all the reasons why it developed in the first place. Uh, I have colleagues, because I also do work in organizations, I'm not going to talk about this today, but I'm coming back to give a talk at the B-School in a couple weeks, too, so you can come to that if you're looking for punishment. <laughs> but we have, we have data from organizations where, you know, a lot of companies are trying to get working class to be more creative and to try on new things. And that's just, you know, that's something that is not part of the psychology that you've been trained for a very long time. Uh, it just means that we have, have a different approach to these kinds of bridging these divides, which I'll get back to a little bit later. Okay, so I'm going to talk a, lot, a little about the neuroscience of what we've been doing. This is kind of going from nations to neurons. I was really surprised when I started looking at the literature uh, in neuroscience about how little there is on social norms. I mean, it's incredible that they're so omnipresent, so invisible, so important for our coordination on a daily basis, but we don't know much about it in terms of how it is in brain. Um, there's certainly some research on neuroscience and economic gains and fairness, but not on what's happening when people are doing weird things. 
and violating norms. So in this particular study, this is done with um, Shinobu Kiyama and Shibi Han, and also my postdoc, Yan Mu, uh, we wanted to see are there cultural differences in brain activity related to social norm violations. Um, and we wanted to see if these differences, these neural psychological differences, predict anything. Do they predict the same trade-off I've been talking about at all this analysis? Is this activity differences predicting greater self-control, but greater ethnocentrism and lower creativity uh, in certain groups than others? We also wanted to show that they're distinct from other violations that you might witness. So it's different for me to say Mary's in the library and she's shouting, which is a norm violation, than me saying Michelle is having coffee with dog. That's what people call linguistic violation, semantic violation. There's a huge literature on this, that incongruity, but it's different. And it, it should be, uh, it, for example, we shouldn't see a lot of cultural differences on this kind of violation, but we should see in countries that we designated as great or tight or loose that there's a different pattern of brain activity when it comes to social norm violations. Likewise, we didn't expect that brain activity related to, to linguistic violations would be related to these kinds of trade-offs, but really the social norm violations would be. We were particularly interested in the N400, a negative deflection of brain activity after the onset of a, a stimulus that has to do with incongruity. So if I started dancing, you would have a really strong N400. And you'd probably tell him, why did you invite this, this crazy woman here? Please don't invite her back. Uh, and that's what we were doing. We were, we were using EEG and measuring what's happening in the brain uh, as people were witnessing more violations. We had a large number of stimuli. So this gives you a sense of the method. It's published in PNAS last year, we have basically a sort of a control condition that's appropriate behavior. Amanda's in the tango lesson, she's dancing. That's perfectly reasonable. <laughs> Amanda is in the park, she's dancing. That's kind of weird, but it's not as weird as Amanda being in the museum and dancing. I mean, maybe the MoMA in New York, but as people were going through all these uh, behavior situation types of stimuli, we were asking them how strongly appropriate or inappropriate they were and so forth. So they were going through various different trials. And what we found was extremely interesting. We found some really interesting similarities first. And I was always taught to look for similarities, <coughs> differences across cultural data. Uh, we found that the central parietal area um, had very similar levels of activity when it came to N400 when people were witnessing these strong violations in the US or China. Uh, and that's a lot of where the N400 research has been. Mm -hmm. So there's clearly people are detecting norms, violations in both cultures. But what we found were very strong differences in the frontal area of the brain. This is the area that evolved later. It involves theory of mind, it involves theory of punishment, preparation for punishment. And here we see a very strong M400 response in China and a very weak response in the United States. Of course, there'd be variation in various states in social classes. But in general, we could see that there's Strong cultural differences in the frontal area when it comes to evaluating these behaviors. And these differences mediated other important differences we found at the behavioral level. So after they were going through these uh, violations or appropriate behavior, we asked them questions about self-control. We asked them questions about cultural superiority. The same questions we asked uh, in the science paper coming from the World Value Survey. And we also had them do some creativity tasks. And the idea is that if your really brain is very, very um, sensitive to norm violations, that it's harder to be creative on other tasks. This is the same task that we've given out in other contexts with the working class and other, other <coughs> groups. But on the flip side, we could see that cost cultural difference in self-control and uh, were um, mediated by 400 between Americans uh, and Chinese. So that it, it pushed towards greater self-control in terms of reacting strongly to normal violations in this data. So this is just a way we can start thinking about what, how do these things become ingrained? Uh, before I talk about cultural change, I want to tell you about one other really weird study that we did recently that just came out in SCAN, Social Neuroscience Journal. And this was really trying to use neuroscience to test a particular part of tight loose theory. Because I'm, as you can see, very methodologically promiscuous, <laughs> you might say. But I like to choose methods that are well suited to answering different questions. And in this particular case, we've always had the assumption that tightness develops as a function of threat because people need to coordinate. So the first thing we wanted to ask in this question, in this study was, does threat, the perception of that, actually make people more coordinated in human groups? This is in dyads. And moreover, we want to think about this from a neuroscience perspective. What's happening in the brain that's enabling that coordination? Is it the case that brains become more synchronized as people are under threat? So this is actually a hyper EEG study. Here we have people, this is Yan, my postdoc, 
she's wearing the EEG cap. But what we have here is a situation where we have two people interacting, both wearing the EEG cap, and they're put into different conditions of threat. And as they're put into conditions of threat, we're also <coughs> measuring brain synchrony, and then they're doing a different coordination task. And we could try to look at some of these assumptions. So what do we do? We had three conditions. In one condition, this is all done in China. We had one condition where they read a newspaper article that had been piloted to focus on how Japan was a pretty threatening uh, country to them over the next five, ten years. Pretty realistic, actually. We found people believe this. In another condition, this is between subjects, we had different people reading the same exact article, but it was about an outgroup threat. It was between Ethiopia and Nutria. So it said the same exact thing, but it was an activating threat, but not on one soil. And then we had a third condition, which was about China, but not about threat. So that was the between subject context. Uh, then what we did was we had them in, engage in a coordination task. They were in different rooms, and they were told they have to count at the same exact time. Um, and they were given, given feedback over many trials doing this about how, la how much lag time they have between <coughs> their responses, how, how coordinated they are. So if you were in this study, you would be uh, having to count to, let's say, five and in your mind, and then you press the computer when you were done, and then you would get feedback, here's the lag time between you and participant in the other room. So they can't see each other, they can't kind of play any uh, sort of co coordination games through their, ver their verbal and nonverbal language. Um, and they did this across many different uh, phases, and they also did this with a computer as well as a control group. You can read the details and scan, it's also on my website. At the same time, we're measuring brain synchrony. What's happening with their, their sort of neural synchrony at this time? Neural synchrony has been examined in other contexts of like musicians um, uh, and other contexts, but not with respect to coordination and threat. So this is the first kind of bringing in some of the ecological variation. We're interested into neuroscience. Uh, and we were particularly interested in gamma, ga gamma wave synchrony. Gamma wave synchrony is a very high level um, brain wave where we're interested in fear. So this is supposedly indes index indexing fear. At the individual level, if I flash a snake in front of your eyes, your gamma waves will go off. Um, other waves are also relevant, uh, alpha waves and theta waves, but we were particularly interested in, in gamma waves. So what we found in this study, I'm just going to um, show you some of the behavioral data. You can just kind of focus on this here. So we have in-group threat, out-group threat, and in-group control. We have I'm going to focus on the coordination task with humans. This is with computers. But you can see here that the lag time for in-group threat was much more, uh, was much smaller when groups were under this condition as compared to out-group threat or control condition. So people are actually able to coordinate their behavior much more when they think that there's a, a threat on their soil. And that's one of the first demonstrations of behavior like this. We have actually two studies, one other study that supported in scan that replicated this with a different sample. What was interesting, though, was looking at some of the, this is all looks like kind of crazy wiring. <laughs> but here we are, we're looking at electrodes, and we're measuring brain synchrony and seeing how it's interacting with the prime. And what you see on this, just concentrate on the red bars here with the humans, that you see that the synchrony, uh, in terms of brain synchrony on gamma waves, is much higher in the in-group threat condition than it was in the other conditions. There was no other effective other waves of brain synchrony. Uh, and what's more interesting for our point of view is that this partially mediated the influence of in-group threat on coordination. So this is just to say that we can look at, we can use neuroscience to test some of the basic tenets of what's happening when people are feeling under threat with respect to coordination and brain synchrony. We have some other work now that's going on on, on this with fMRI to try to look, kind of look more at this neural circuitry around this. Uh, we have other work that's comparing this to just feeling personally threatened when you just ask people about their personal threats it doesn't activate the same type loose psychology. So it really is about collective coordination problems. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting now into the dynamics. How do these things change? I mean, there are, culture as we know is dynamic. It doesn't stay static. Um, and we can look at this first in the lab, and then we can look at it more with computational methods to see exactly um, change of populations. When we looked at this at the individual level, we wanted to say, can we make Americans temporarily look more like Singaporeans? <laughs> you know, these are these rinky-dink prime studies that come from psychology. Um, they're nice because they can help us to assess causality, because we can be very strict in how we randomly assign people to threat. They're kind of lacking in realism, because obviously people, uh, even if we temporarily tighten them up, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to be a long-lasting change. Also, priming is individual level. It's not group level necessarily. So this is where um, we can use this as a, another data point 
for understanding mechanisms, but it's not ideal. But we did this in the lab. Maryland's a place that is pretty ambiguous when it comes to population density, for example. You can't do the study in, in Japan. But we can say in, in Maryland, in one condition, we can assign people to a condition that says, you know, population density here is really, really high. Like, it's one of the highest out of all campuses. Uh, oh, yeah, look at that. We even include UCLA here. This is all fictitious data, by the way. Uh, and we have a newspaper article that says, yeah, you know, you can barely get a seat in the classrooms. Like, it's really hard to get lunch in the union. Uh, you can think about Maryland. It's a big land-grant institution that, you know, it, it feels like in this condition, yeah, I remember times when this place is crazy packed. But in another condition, we can tell people, you know, it turns out Maryland's like rock bottom on population density. Uh, where is see that? Now it's still the same. You know, just, and, and then newspaper articles say, you know, these, you know you, sometimes you around this camp, you don't see anyone. And actually, again, it's believable when you put in this condition. We pilot tested these stimuli. Uh, and we then asked them simple, the same questions we've been asking all sorts of other studies. We asked them about how they react to different norm violations. Um, and then we could see that, in general, in a high population density context, <coughs> Maryland students were much more bent out of shape when people violated norms as they were under conditions, in the po low population condition. They also uh, have more cultural superiority. You start getting more ethnocentric. You start seeing more of this kind of switch toward a tight mindset when you feel like there's, you're packed in with people and when you need to coordinate. Um, we also, after the Boston bombing, this is hard to get this kind of data. You're usually not prepared for these kind of tragedies, right? But we got out there, we got some data asking people, how close were you to this incident? How, how personally salient and relevant was this to you? And we asked them about their perceptions of the tight and loose nature of the country. Is it too, are we too tight or are we too loose? Are we just right? And people in this context who perceived a lot of threat felt the U.S. was too loose. And they were also showing more evidence of cultural superiority. So you can see that even in the field, we have a temporary threat, like in the Boston bombing, we could see that people start to tighten up. Now, what we did was, and I'm almost kind of getting through, this is one, I think I have maybe a couple more studies to show, I promise you're in a great audience. Uh, I want to wrap it up soon so we can get to some questions. But let me just kind of talk to you about the evolutionary basis. I know many people here are interested in evolution. And uh, I've had this great um, fortune to work with some really great evolutionary game theorists at Maryland, Dana Now. Uh, so I'm Day, Patrick Ruse. We have a now group where we train sort of students in both psychology and computer science to work with each other. Uh, and we were interested in just threat caused the evolution of <laughs> strong norms and punishment. Um, now we're looking at computational methods that have their own benefit of looking at change over large populations, but they're, that's better than priming, but also they're very superficial, right? They're really artificial, they're not even about people. But they have their place in this kind of story about using different methods to test some of the theories. So in this particular study, um, we had a, this was published at OBSGP a couple years ago. We were looking at a uh, two-stage game where we have a variety of different punishment strategies that come from a nature paper by Dawson. Uh, cooperation, defect, or be opportunistic, decide on what you think the reputation is your neighbor when you make a decision to cooperate with defect. In stage two, we had four different punishment strategies. Either you could decide to responsibly punish defectors, we also had spiteful punishment. The agent just punished everyone. Maybe there's some of you out there like that. Uh, Antisocial punishment, which is kind of a weird strategy. It's found in, many, in some cultural groups, as you know, where people punish cooperators. Uh, and non-punishment, just don't punish anybody. And what we did in the study is that we were interested in the role of threat in the evolution of these strategies. Which of these strategies tend to dominate in groups that are highly threatened? Threat was operationalized uh, by a reduction of payoff, of the agent's payoff. You can see in the paper, transform to a sinusoid curve. This was the idea was that natural disasters, warfare, and so forth are having an impact on the payoff of agents. Then we can manipulate this across many, many simulations, groups that are highly threatened versus are not very threatened. And what you can see is some of the results. This is just the first stage of the model. I'm just going to kind of go through. The red here is defecting. The, the, the um, line up here is percentage of cooperators, broadly defined as uh, opportunistic and cooperation strategies. And you can see that as threats increasing, agents are getting more cooperative. And defection is, is actually getting much less pronounced. Uh, what's interesting to see is that also under lower threat, there's a lot of different strategies that exist in the population. This is kind of a variety of what we see in loose cultures. Or lots of variability. As we get more threatened, certain types of strategies become much more dominant. You see this also with responsible punishment. The green line here is responsible punishment. The other strategies are spiteful and other punishment strategies I talked about. 
it's very clear that even when there's a lot of cooperation, you still have a lot of responsible punishers around in the high threatening conditions. Again, at lower levels of threat, you have lots of different strategies that exist in terms of punishment in this model. Um, we also did the same model, it's in the paper and supplemental, with coordination games, not just the prisoner dilemma. So you can see that it replicates. Uh, and I just want to mention, this is kind of a good indi uh, indication of like a Boston bombing <laughs> computational approach. What we can see is in populations where there's a suddenly increased threat, what happens uh, in terms of cooperation and punishment. And you see the same thing. If the individual population has low threat for a while, when you temporarily increase the threat, they have more cooperation and more responsible punishment. <coughs> when you temporarily decrease threat, it takes a little longer, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but you, you <coughs> gradually see that the cooperation starts to decline. You have this variety of strategies that are found in the population as compared to uh, when you have more cooperation, more responsible punishment. Okay, so this is um, just some of the approaches we've been using, using computational approaches um, to understand the evolution uh, of, of type use in, in groups. A couple more things I want to mention. I think you probably knew I was going to go here at some point. I can't have a talk without talking about Trump or the pan of Brexit. But I think the important point here is that threat is not necessarily objective. It could be manipulated. It could be engineered. And it could produce very similar effects. Um, and I think this is not something that's really necessarily a modern phenomenon, clearly. This has been something that's happened over you know, centuries, where leaders activate threat, uh, target groups that are very threatened, and, and use it to their advantage. Uh, and we have some data, we published this in uh, the Huffington Post before Trump was elected, where we simply asked people, random sample of Americans, uh, how threatened they felt about ISIS, about Mexico, about all sorts of, about Korea, uh, and other threats. And in these groups, the more threatened people felt, the more they desired greater tightness in the United States, they felt that it was too loose, too disorganized, and this predicted them voting for Trump. We found the same exact thing um, with uh, Le Pen, it's the same data that we collected in France. So it's important that to recognize that these things are also, um, can be manipulated. We, we sort of end this, these, these uh, op-eds talking about, you know, that as citizens we have to be kind of mindful of how threatened are we really. It doesn't mean that we're not ever threatened, but that we have to uh, have some a reasonable conversation about levels of threat. So the last thing I want to say is uh, this is usually the kind of big question I get was which is better, tight or loose, for societal happiness. Um, we know that, for example, in the research on individualism, that individualistic cultures tend to be happier than collectivist cultures the main effect. But we have the sense that norm strength is kind of curvilinear. And it might even explain some of the um, problems that we have around the world when we get too extreme <coughs> in either direction. Actually, we're not the first to say this. Um, Fromm talked about when you have too much freedom, you need more structure, more authority, uh, more rules. Um, Durkheim contrasted groups that had what he called <coughs> egoistic suicide versus fatalistic suicide. <coughs> fatalistic suicide groups, they felt too constrained, overly repressed, and that made them want to escape. But in other groups that had what he called anime, too few rules, too much disorganization, also wanted to escape. He, he showed this in, in his book on suicide with a select sample of groups. Uh, Etzioni, who's in Washington, a sociologist, also talked about the need for a balance uh, in freedom and constraint, freedom and order. And we wanted to try to test this with our data. And we had the same prediction, that there should be a curvilinear effect, uh, that extreme levels of tightness or looseness are maladaptive, and they should be maladaptive for a wide variety of phenomena. And we've got data on suicide, on depression, on blood pressure, on happiness, and some other variables. It was replicated with another group in a different paper. This came out in PLOS One. But you could see a very stable curvilinear pattern that uh, in our data, a lot of the former communist countries, Ukraine, Estonia, and so forth, were very, very, very loose, coming from a very strict order and then going to an opposite sort of pendulum shift. Uh, was causing a lot of problems. Um, you saw this with Duterte recently also. I visit the Philippines quite a bit. I do some work on terrorism. And over the years, I've noticed it disintegrating. Uh, and that is exactly what Fromm called the escape from freedom. There's just so much anime and so much disorder. You have someone like Duterte who comes in who is promising order, and people like that. And he's very popular. The same happened with Russia, with Putin. There was uh, after collapse of communism, there was a really serious sense of disorder and anime. It happened with ISIS, <coughs> where we see that the context <coughs> where, um, where ISIS was able to take over, with some data to this effect, were the ones that have the least security and the most anime. 
So this is just to say that um, if we can start thinking about this curvilinear pattern, we might be able to identify contexts that more, are more or less at risk for instability and for um, low, really dis high dysfunction. So I'll just end with saying that um, I think we can think about how to use theory on culture and norms to, um, to identify contexts where we have to tighten up, where maybe we get too loose, or we have to loosen up, we're getting too tight. A um, good example of this is the internet. I call this the wild west of the, the internet, wild by west. I mean, it's, it's a completely normless context. It's, uh, we now are seeing much more examples of um, bad behavior, fake news, of um, bullying, and we can see some sort of bottom-up emergence of, of some contexts like Reddit that have strong normative organizing. We see some contexts where CEOs are taking some of Twitter, of Facebook are starting to take some accountability for re regulating, providing more security and regulation uh, as opposed to total freedom. Of course, this is a really delicate balance. Um, but it's important because we learned, we evolved as humans to first organize normatively in small groups, then we started being able to organize with norms in large scale groups, but now we're trying to organize in a totally different place, which is the internet. So we need to figure out how to, how to, um, how to have the right balance of tight loose, I think, on the internet. Uh, but there's also lots of other contexts where we've seen uh, groups that realize they got to the extremes. The good example is the Iceland model um, that's now touted as a very great program that tried to tighten up norms around alcoholism. In, in Iceland at the time, Several years ago, there was a huge problem with youth and alcoholism and safety, um, and they implemented a program that really helped to um, to make uh, the place more uh, more safe and, and less destructive. But also, this place is where we have, to, we have to try to understand when we have to loosen norms. This is a lot. What I'm writing about these days is about contexts that relate to large populations where there's strong norms for large families. We see this. Is a very, these, these are grounded in honor norms, they're grounded in survival norms in a lot of places, uh, and they're producing a lot of problems with respect to overpopulation and associated problems with poverty, with conflict, and so forth. Um, I just ran an actual in, workshop in Israel on this, which is a really interesting context, because Israel, is, our, our data is quite loose, even though it should be tight. Uh, I mean, it's clearly pockets of tightness and looseness in the country, but it's, it's quite loose. Um, and actually, a lot of reasons why it's loose in general is because Judaism, of which I can say you're personally familiar with this, is a, is a religion of debate. And debate pushes people toward looseness. There's that joke that there's you know, several Jews in the room, there's like 10 opinions. Um, and, um, but, so Israel is, is relatively loose. It's also loose because of, it's very diverse. Uh, other people say it's loose because people have learned not to follow the rules for good reasons. That's sort of a, you know, an anecdotal hypothesis. But it's, loose. It's, it's really relatively loose. But the one domain that's very, very tight in Israel is having large families. Um, and um, I've been told that you're better off being you know, a criminal than not having kids in Israel. I mean, clearly, the pressure to have kids is found in all cultures. But it's very, very strong. And it even comes from top down, from Ben-Gurion, from other people. The, the self, sense of stigma for not having kids is very strong. And Alain Tal, a colleague in the public policy program that the dean at Tel Aviv wrote a book called This Land is Full, where he started to show the demographics of Israel being completely unsustainable if it continues along this path of having large families. Um, and a lot of what he said in his New York Times Review article about the book was that, you know, Jews will argue about everything, but they don't want to talk about this. This very, very strong resistance, and he's gotten some pretty nasty feedback about it. And so we started organizing. He came to Maryland, we had some coffee, and we said, let's try to connect our research programs, and how do we think about trying to loosen these norms um, that people feel so accountable to in terms of large families. They operated for a long time in helping Israel um, to survive, but now they're threatening its survival. So that's kind of an interesting question. And the same is the case in many other countries where CARE and UNICEF have been going in. And they realize now that a lot of the problems they're trying to deal with are not about personal attitudes, they're about social norms. OK, so I'll just say that. One other issue is just trying to identify um, places where there are rapid pendulum shifts and potential enemy that might lead to extremism, lead to the desire for strong rulers who <coughs> tighten things up. Uh, and I gave some of the examples before. Uh, and I'll just kind of end it there. Uh, I hope that um, we can sort of, uh, what I've tried to show you today is how we could take a construct that originated in anthropology from Pelto and start thinking about how it fits with nations, with states, uh, with social class, with other things that um, 
other domains in which we have to organize through norms uh, and the consequences that they uh, confer to human groups. Uh, I'll just have a shameless plug that I have a book coming out on this topic for a uh, general audience. It's coming out in September, published by Simon Schuster. Uh, it's probably the hardest thing I've ever done to, to write a book for it that's actually not, that's accessible, that people can understand. Like my father, who read every chapter, and he's always complaining that we don't make any sense to a general audience. <laughs> Uh, and so, um, yeah, but thank you for your attention, and um, I'm glad we have some time for, for some discussion. We'd love to hear your comments and questions. And then you, but on the other hand, you tend to have a lot more looseness. Yeah. So, why some scales and not others? How, how, like how how would you, if you were to do this on ten different scales and you only found these correlations in five of them, how yeah. would you reconcile that? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, the urban context actually is a perfect. It's a great question because, in fact, what you see in urban areas is that they're highly anonymous, right? They're, they're contexts where people are highly mobile and they're not accountable for their actions. And they're exposed to a lot of diversity. So that's another thing I didn't get to talk about, but looseness goes along with being not monitored and also having a lot of diversity around you. Uh, and so actually, even though there's higher population density, especially in the United States, you can escape that. So I like to say, like, you can go out to the Hamptons if you're getting too crowded. But that population density is not... <coughs> as extreme as it would be in a place like Singapore where it's very, very high, 18,000 people per square mile, versus, and we can't escape it, and where there's a lot of potential for conflict. So I don't think urban areas are threatened as much. Uh, they might become more threatened that, you know, as, as we see people moving in and urbanization occurs, but my sense is that they have this perfect signature that promotes looseness, which is a lack of accountability, lack of monitoring, and um, mobility and diversity that pushes it toward looseness. Um, I think a lot of the, you know, a lot of the support for Giuliani was that he was trying to tighten up the city in New York, for example. It had all sorts of negative consequences when it came to discrimination and other things. But uh, there's many people who sort of bemoan the fact that New York City now is a, a cesspool of, of anti numbered behavior. <coughs> it's a place where it's called now the city that won't shut up. There's so much noise pollution. Um, now, th to your point, though, there, it's an interesting question about at what point does that become very threatening, right? At what point does that become enemy? That's a question that I think we can look at over time, because I do think that those contexts, if they get really super loose and animus, then we'll see some pendulum shifts. This is what Alain Tal is trying to argue for. He's arguing that um, these kinds of pressures in Israel will make it unsustainable to be loose in this context. So I think that's an empirical question, but I, I do think that cities are actually bastions of looseness for a lot, variety of those reasons. Yeah? So I, it, tell yeah. me your name, too, so, so I can Jacob start. Thomas, fifth year sociology. So I was thinking a lot about hypocrisy um, through your talk, and I think a lot of the time these kind of um, tightness and looseness identities are kind of social identities as well that people cling to. And um, I think there's a lot of evidence that a lot of these threats, their impact may be heterogeneous depending on kind of the, how much, how, how overwhelming kind of the threat or the, the impact is. And I think of particular examples of, um, for example, it can both operate in the looteness and tightness context, but just like the tightness context like the whole issue about out of wedlock childbirths like skyrocketing and you know um, red states type conservative mm -hmm. type states you might say um, because a lot of people you know may not be willing to use condoms or contraception and on the and, and as well as the opiate epidemic 
you know, not, not preparing for those kind of rules, uh, the structure of the rules, not in the, uh, preparing people to kind of adapt to those. I suppose in the looseness context, you can think of similar things where in these kind of um, environments, maybe like Silicon Valley or academia, there's a, there's a presumption that, you know, there is an egalitarian kind of, everyone's kind of on the same level, but not really. I mean, we know there's like social hierarchies, but people will often, you know, play with that ambiguity, but oftentimes that can also, like, you know, Durkheim pointed out, the can and me, and so on. So, and the second thing I was just wondering, like, it'd be interesting to look, you talk about electoral politics, but there could be a lot of other mechanisms this could be working through. I think of Annette Leroux's work on different parroting strategies in working class and upper class mm -hmm. neighborhoods and uh, teaching strategies yep. in upper and middle class schools. <coughs> Um, you talk about electoral politics, but you know, in China, obviously, the Communist Party, you know, depending on how far away from Beijing you live, might have very different yeah. effects. So, it'd be interesting yeah. to think about what sort of social yeah. mechanisms. Yeah, I think that your first issue, um, the question about um, hypocrisy, is very interesting. I mean, the sense that um, what do we find threatening? Uh, one thing I'm really interested in is gun control as an example of that, because you could have that on your list. You yeah. know, you have in the, in the red states, people who feel very threatened by the U.S. government, right? They feel like they need to have guns just in case the U.S. government starts to attack them, right? This is kind of, you know, and, and actually that is one domain where they want more freedom, right? Because, and in this case, it's because of threats. So there are d domains of life that I think we can still understand through this flashlight that sound to kind of at first seem analogous. Um, you know, so I think we have to think about you know, kind of where people are threatened and what, what that's causing. Are we, are, is the U.S. government really that threatening, you know, is one question. Um, the other question about uh, working class and parenting and schools, I've been writing about this. I mean, these are all contexts that are producing the same psychology. Even um, Bernstein talked about the structure of households among working class kids and how they're structured in terms of rooms. There's much more open layouts uh, in, working in middle class kids' homes. Uh, the language that's used in his research, um, he's a sociologist, uh, was sociolinguist, was really more about structure and, and, and less counterfactuals among the working class. There are so many ways in which the strength of norms is reinforced. Going into classrooms, the emphasis on creativity is much different. I've written about this also. So that's why culture is so hard to change, right? Because it's not just coming from one source. It's coming from many sources, starting with parents, going into teachers, into the structure of our, our households into the language we use. So trying to change it, obviously, would be very difficult. Um, and of course, electoral politics are very multiply determined. Uh, I could say that in our data, we measured authoritarianism. It wasn't predicting nearly as much as people's beliefs about the, strength, the need for strong organizing around norms. Authoritarianism is a personality trait. Um, conservatism is a personality attitude. It's an attitude where Tightness is about culture, it's about the environment that one's in. So they're certainly related, but they're operating at different levels of analysis. Um, and so that's where I think we need to kind of clearly delineate these things across levels, e even though they're related. Yeah, and tell me your name too. Me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, my name is Andrew. Um, thank you, there's a lot of uh, interesting material to think about here. Um, so I wanted to, you know, pursue <coughs> some of the points that Brooke had brought up um, a little, uh, you know, I just, I just sort of want to push those a little bit. And so my first question is, um, to what extent is the presence of tightness about social norms specific to the content of those norms, right? So do you have, I mean, if, is it like a G factor sort of thing where if you're tight, you have tightness across all these norms or is it, you know, sort of breaking apart based on the content of the norm to be navigated. So that's sort of my first concern. My second is, so if, if we take seriously the fractal analogy, then the presence of tightness or looseness at the individual level should in some way be structuring the way in which tightness or looseness is manifesting at the state level and at the national level. And so, so I guess I'm a little, you know, I'm, I'm wondering about sort of these, you know, breaking points that you see at the national level, right? So 
you know, Germany might have very strict norms at a, as a nation about, you know, timeliness of trains and something like that, but it seems like there's actually a lot, a much higher degree of looseness in terms of the kinds of, like, sexual behavior that somebody in a Western context <laughs> might be able to engage in. So, um, yeah, thinking about the, the domains of tightness or looseness and how these are manifesting across levels, I, I, I'm concerned about sort of the ontological continuity of the construct yeah. across those levels. I think this is a fair question. Uh, I write about these exact examples. Uh, I find it not particularly problematic that you could have a context where there's a lot of strong norms and some do select domains of looseness. The United States is pretty loose, but we're pretty tight when it comes to privacy. The question in those contexts is why? Why do those certain domains evolve to be tight or loose? And there's sometimes it's idiosyncratic. Sexual behavior is actually something that evolved, from my understanding, in Germany out of uh, reaction to Nazism. Sexual behavior here tends to be tighter because of the evolution of Puritanism. Privacy here is a very, very important value. And I think in any culture, the values that are extremely important evolve to be tight. So I think it's perfectly reasonable that you can classify a group as having a greater preponderance of tight domains versus loose domains and still um, see that you can find domains that are loose or tight in them. Um, I think the HARAF data, the standard sample data, is really interesting in this respect also. We don't find that socialization, gender, funerals, all these things are not related. In the traditional societies, they tend to be correlated. We don't find contexts where there's like just random domains of tight and loose. They tend to be correlated. So that means that there's some kind of spillover in general across domains in contexts where there's threat, even though you can find contexts that are loose or tight. And Israel is another example of that. In our data and in a lot of other um, discussions, Israel's real, relatively loose. You can also find domains where it's extremely tight, like in, in having large families. Then again, the question is theoretically, where does that come from? Can we see a similar logic? How do we kind of predict these things a priority? We've now started to develop domain scales of tight loose <coughs> to try to do some of that. The question is, what are the universal domains um, that normative organizing is done in? We can sort of see some of that in Haraf with some of our initial data. Uh, but clearly things like sex, authority, language, communication, these are things that we all human groups have to have some norms on. Uh, and then we can start looking and zooming in and having, let's say, profiles of tight loose in countries or in certain groups. And I think that would be reasonable. Uh, so that's my kind of, that's my thinking about this. If you think about it as a microscope, sometimes we want to kind of broaden out and sort of get a big picture level of something, like we went when we're looking at space, sometimes we want to zoom in. We might have a specific interest when it comes to some domain, like population explosion, and we need to use the theory differently. Uh, but I think it still gives some sense of, um, of order in that predictive context. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Oh, hi. Um, I'm going to stand up because it's hard to hear you. I'm Elisa Loft. I'm assistant professor in sociology, and I know many of us sociologists are asking questions. Um, so I would oh, just good. say this is fascinating. And I do similar-ish work on violence, cognition, and moral judgment. And I think moral judgment can be thought of as people evaluating norm violations, right? So I was curious, um, particularly when you're looking at the neuroscientific studies, um, if you've considered how social relationships and perceptions mediate that judgment process. So for example, this study, I think the woman's name was Maria who was dancing, or, or did she not have a name? Did I just come up with that? No, uh, it was, I Man. forget who it was, but it, we had this, uh, yeah. we actually yeah. looked at both uh, both uh, male and female names in this. Okay, yeah, so it's not like, you know, both male and female names, um, so men and women violating norms, are the, men and, are the men and women white, are they immigrants, are they Muslim, how that might alter that judgment process, yeah. um, the strength of which someone's prefrontal cortex is activating, like this is not yeah. okay, or this is dangerous, or this is not normal. Yeah. Um, so I was curious about that. And then I was also really interested, um, you know, at the national level, you looked at how interstate wars matter as a form of threat that possibly shapes nation's mm -hmm. norm, violation, tightness, looseness. Did you consider how intra, um, intrastate mm -hmm. wars, because you looked at it at the state level, but I'm curious if, Having experienced a civil war, experienced yeah. a genocide, 
might likewise yeah. affect norm tightness or looseness yeah. at the national yeah. level? Oh, these are great questions. So let me start with the first one. We have some data on that question. It's very exciting. Uh, that was in Psych Science a couple years ago. And I would definitely argue that minorities and women uh, and homosexuals live in tighter worlds. Um, we know that people in power are able to have much wider range of behavior that's seen as acceptable. We see that with their own. Well, I'm not going to go there. Just in case. <laughs> uh, and, and we actually showed that. And, uh, and so in this particular case, we had bank managers in one study evaluating um, women and minorities, Lakeisha or Jamal or Mary or Edward, doing all sorts of deviant behaviors in organizations, drawing on some of Robinson's typology of deviant behavior. And we can see very clearly that, um, and that's just not in the field study, in the lab study, that, um, that, they're that women and minorities are evaluated much more harshly for the same deviant behavior. Actually, we sent this study, this study was inspired by Betty Duke's civil action suit against Walmart, and we actually sent her the paper. I don't, know if she, I don't know if she ever read it. But it was about how women who come to late, or minorities come to late to work, or do other things that are violating, are treated with different standards. And that was the, exact, the entire the base of her, her dispute. And we could see that in our study, it was also very interesting that it seemed that our white majority males were letting other white majority males off the hook for the same uh, behavior. So you can see this in psych science. And I do believe that, um, that that's a really important area uh, to look at. In, we haven't looked at it with neuroscience, but I think we would, that would be very interesting to look at you know, in terms of um, the consequences of, of living in those tighter worlds and looking at how it's ingrained. Um, people who are stigmatized also obviously live in tighter worlds. Um, we have some data that uh, we published in the new journal Behavioral and Policy, Science and Policy that looks at, for example, how immigrants who feel discriminated against um, are attracted to radical ideologies. You know, it's, th these groups are targeting people who feel excluded and feel powerless and feel like they're being discriminated against because of their gender. And we can see that's even more extreme in places like Germany. So that just suggests that these, are, these things have important implications for <coughs> when you're treated differently based on your power status. Um, so I think that's a really interesting point. Um, the second question, um, we haven't looked at that, but I think that there, it's clearly the case that a lot of contexts that have very serious internal conflict in Rwanda and other contexts like that are, you know, th these rulers are also very tight to try to keep order in these contexts because it's so delicate. Uh, I've done some work in Sri Lanka uh, and I've noticed that, you know, and again, I'm not arguing for authoritarianism, <laughs> but, you know, in some contexts, actually, um, Bob, Ka Bob Kaplan, who wrote The Revenge of Geography, talks about this, that you, know, you can't expect democracy to work everywhere where there's a very fragile piece between very serious conflicts between people that have been devastating. Sri Lanka is a good example of a place where I think it's gotten extremely loose and it's causing problems, that the tight authoritarian government with its problems had its, was controlling a lot of the conflict. So I don't want to go there because it's very fine line. But I do believe that those contexts often um, you know, require some degree of order to prevent chaos. Yeah. I'm tempted to take issue with your uh, equation between argumentativeness and Judaism, but I won't. Um. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I just want to mention my daughter, who was just bat mitzvahed last year, started reading me her bat mitzvah speech. And she start, and this is when you're supposed to talk about how it connects with your life. And she starts disagreeing with the Torah portion. And I said, sweetie, like, what are you doing disagreeing with the Torah portion? And she's like, the rabbi told me to do that. <laughs> the rabbi told me. I mean, it's, it's like a sport. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, and that's a good thing. You know, it just means that there's multiple perspectives, so it's hard to agree on one right answer. Yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, there's sort of implicit evolutionary psychology in, in um, uh, portions of your talk. Let me draw some explicit parallels and contrasts with um, evolutionary psychology. So with regard to your work on class, um, uh, sort of standard life history theory explanations would suggest that um, the people facing the greatest poverty, disenfranchisement, violence, and so on should be on the fastest life history trajectory. They should discount the future steeply as a consequence of that, leading them to um, engage in what are deemed to be impulsive self-control yeah. behavior problems that could be more sexually promiscuous and so on. Um, it's certainly possible that your working class is a step above that, That's as right. it were, in the social hierarchy. That's right. Because it's the unemployed class where we see That's right. really fast life history. Actually, 
And on that point, um, you remind me of Ben. Ben, who came here over coming to Maryland, <laughs> was interested in just this. Actually, I couldn't recruit last year, so that's good. But we're going to hire him eventually. <laughs> uh, the idea was that the, the very seriously poor are in contexts that are anime. That they're, they're actually in our continuum of dysfunctional looseness. Because there's, less, there's not a lot of monitoring, there's you know, serious amounts of, uh, uh, of um, disorganization that, require, that makes that strategy very, um, that short life term strategy. So the, I, I guess what I should say is in response to that, I think it's really important that the working class that we're looking at are trying to avoid that. And we don't have data on this. And we also, by the way, don't, I would say it's even more curvilinear class than I've described it. You know, you think about Victorian England. Super rich, but super tight, right? And in some ways, people in these contexts, my, my reading of, of the, looking at some <coughs> old, you know, books on a Victorian era was that these people were very worried about losing their status, where they'd be ostracized and be basically um, disenfranchised completely. So there was very strong rule orientation. So I actually think that it's curvilinear and that the working poor is uh, exceedingly loose. Uh, well, and then the working class is trying to avoid that. And the middle class has more latitude, but then when you get higher up. So it, it yes, also relates to a scribe, a scribe chat status, a chief status. There's a lot of other complexities. But I think you could still use the same lens to, to analyze them. OK, so lest we seem to agree too much. Um, <laughs> that uh, would be not good for him, right? He's got a <laughs> let's look at the other end of the scale. So um, in, in your work on social class, you're describing the, the upper class individuals as, you know, they have, looser in general across the board, right? But that, that conflicts strongly with the life history perspective because doing the things that are, assuming that some of that um, upper class status is achieved and not ascribed, right? Then doing the things that it takes to succeed in that world requires a very low future discount rate. You can't go to graduate school, business school, medical school, whatever it is, if you're constantly preferring present rewards over future rewards, right? By definition, those are the people who are on the slowest of slow life history trajectories. So those would seem, by your account, to be the people we should expect to be extremely tight. And yet they're the ones you're describing as being the loosest in your social class. Yeah, I mean, I, as I said, I would put the working poor as extremely loose. Right, fine. But okay, the working poor them aside. Yeah. I mean, I think it's an interesting point that there might be some domains in which that self-control has to be very high when it comes to work ethic. But if you look at city streets of what people and, and other contexts and conversations, those people have more power and they're more likely to violate norms in other contexts. So again, we can sort of think about what are the contexts in which you're gonna see uh, people who are in the upper class and middle class uh, being tempted to violate norms of, and, and not be concerned about following the rules. Uh, they're in their own domains of, you know, work and so forth that's a value domain, maybe that's the case, that they're tighter. But in many other domains, I think they'll be looser, including in context of alcoholism, of drugs, and other things like that. So we'll have to kind of visit some of that data together. I'd be curious to see how we can resolve some of that, because I, I think the data suggests that they're more likely to violate norms and be less sensitive to them in all sorts of contexts. Um, and self-control in other contexts might also be suffering. <coughs> but maybe there's select domains that are highly valued that they use the strategy. If you could help me, and what's your name? Martin. Uh -huh. If you could help me clarify for myself, you had the word fractal in your title, <laughs> but it never came up again. So I'm asking: Are you postulating that by looking at small units, you can then endlessly repeat it so you can visualize the whole? Because implicit in what I understood from your talk is that you could use your concept to make predictions and maybe to figure out how to influence changes. And my question is, is culture just too complex to be subject to fractal analysis? I, what I mean by fractal is repeating pattern across different levels of analysis. The talk was trying to identify what that repeating pattern is, both in terms of the antecedents and consequences. What is the reason why Titans might evolve at different scales is very similar. The trade-off that it confers to groups in terms of openness and order is also very similar across different levels. It's a repeated pattern that we can see when we shine this flashlight in different contexts, different levels of analysis. 
I think that qualifies, I mean, I'm not a physicist, but I think that's using the analogy that we can see culture in a very, in a very simple lens can illuminate a lot of dynamics at different levels of analysis. So I actually think it's useful to see how does this one principle help you understand things that are as diverse as, you know, these clocks on city streets uh, and, you know, puppets in the lab with three-year-olds. Those things seem very disconnected in my view. They have been to me. I've kind of journeyed on this by just keeping looking. To, can we see the same pattern? That's why I call it fractal pattern, repeated pattern across different levels with the same quasi-similar homology, quasi-similar. Um, so um, that's, that's how I, I, I didn't repeatedly talk about fractals. I, quite frankly, I thought it was clear that's how, what, where I'm going with it. But I'll make sure that that's clear when I talk about it in other contexts. I, I, I mean, I still see it as a metaphor more than anything. I'm not saying that this is you know, some kind of physical pattern that exists. But I do think that we've ignored, in cross-cultural research, we've ignored this question of are there some general principles that might illuminate a lot of different levels of analysis. So um, that's my quest with this. It doesn't mean it's the only thing that does that. Um, but I think it approximates some you know, uh, parsimony uh, and connects dots that maybe haven't been connected um, through the same lines. Okay, I'm afraid we're all out of time. So we can